Hi, welcome to Cockatoot, Cockatoos with Attitude, episode 96, Disasters, Tornadoes, Hurricanes, Earthquakes, oh my. science knowledge only adds to the excitement the mystery and the awe of a flower evidence is evidence it's public everybody can look at the evidence and assess it and eventually if there's an enough evidence come to the same conclusion The Chloe Sanctuary hopes to give you insight into the health and happiness of your companion parrots we hope to help you build happy homes using reliable and proven tools. The best homes are built on a rock solid foundation. And the best foundation for a happy home is the bedrock of science. When we stand on the shoulders of giants, the scientists who have worked long and diligently to understand our companions, we can reach new heights of understanding. And understanding is the key to success I think treated, most of these birds have a good prognosis, and I would say in... What does avian veterinary medicine have to tell us about our feathered friends? How can the tools of behavior shaping make our homes happier for us and our companions? Shake. How can we deal with biting, screaming, or other misbehavior? What is it like to live among parrots? Let them roam around about you and share a life with them. Of the Chloe Sanctuary for Parrots and Cockatoos, a nonprofit charity dedicated to the empowerment of captive parrots and public awareness. We got a big crowd with us today. We have Coco, Cecil Bird, Babadoo, chosen by our patrons. I had to choose between him and, Pe and Pippa because uh, they don't get along too well yet. Lucy, Lucy, Peaches, Chloe and Snowball, looking like bookends, Lorelei, someone who wants to be called Jabba the Hutt. He likes Jabba the Hutt. I don't know why. Doesn't like to be called Sal anymore. He'll ignore me if I call him Sal, but if I call him Jabba the Hutt, he loves that. And... Our lovely sugar bird. Right, sugar? What are you doing? I see that you're going to get into mischief there, Mr. Cecil Hyde. <clears throat> so, we're going to talk about disasters. We were going to do this episode as part two of our hazards, but this became an episode in itself because the more I delved into it, the more I knew it was going to take a lot to go through this. So, um... The main thing is that disasters affect everywhere, okay? So you gotta be prepared, because if you're not prepared, things may not work out quite so well. Uh, I wasn't prepared the day we had the fire back in 2010, but it worked out. I mean, they all responded, they got into the, their carriers and went out just without any problems, but and when I say without any problems, I grabbed a bird into a carrier, grabbed a bird into a carrier. It was that easy. But it may not be that easy for you. So these are some tips. I can't say we're going to cover everything, but these are some tips, okay? And you don't have to wait till tornado season or hurricane season or I would say earthquake season, but those happen all the time. And it seems like we're starting to have them in different places. A friend of mine uh, lives in New Jersey and there was an earthquake there. And they all thought it was a, an attack, you know, because um, they'd never felt an earthquake before. And I, I kind of get that feeling because, you know, the earth starts shaking and you're up in a building and the whole building's moving. And if you've never been in an earthquake, well, we can't predict those things. So um, you might ask, how can you be prepared? I mean, what do you do to get prepared? Okay that you have an appropriate carrier, that you have everything they need to have. 
that you have a kit that has everything they need for at least seven days. You have plans, what you're going to do, how you're going to do it under different circumstances. Um, and you're going to temp you're going to execute those plans. You're going to pretend, do a little pretend, you know. So, and that's an, a summary, okay? Now, in some cases, you may not be going anywhere. We're going to cover kind of getting out of the place, but you may not be going anywhere. You may just be in a house in the middle of summer. You might live in, in Arizona or California, and it gets to be 95 degrees outside, and the insulation in your home isn't so good like it is in here, and all of a sudden the power goes out. Now, in this place, the power goes out. You've got about an hour and a half before it becomes unlivable. So we have a generator outside. And if something happened to the generator, then it'll be pack them off in the van because that's all set up. All the birds can go bum 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 into their respective cages and they're out of here, okay? I'll show a picture of the van and all that to the patrons and how that's all set up. You're gonna have to examine all the different potential things that can happen. Could we have a hurricane? Could we have a uh, tornado, which I don't know much about. I had to ask other people those questions. If you think I know anything about hurricanes, and I live in San Diego County, I don't. Okay, well, I know what they look like. I study them, but I've never seen one, never been anywhere near one, okay? So, um, so if, you're in the, if you're in California or Arizona or Texas and the power goes out, well, you know, birds who are living in AC, huh, they tend to overheat rather quickly because they're used to being in 70. Lorelei, no. Lorelei, a little minx, no. So, um, you know, they're used to living in 72 degrees. That was the temperature my father loved to have the house at, which he pretty much kept it there. Summer, winter, you name it, it was always 72. So, if the temperature goes anywhere above or below 72, you'd think it would bother me. Well, not like it with the birds. I don't mind so much if it goes over. I'm sorry. Please. I don't mind so much if it goes over. It's when it goes under that it's a problem. So. so if you're in that situation, we'll just cover one quick situation here. You want to make sure you have spray mister bottles on hand. Uh, you want to have Thanks. Bowls for your birds to bathe in. You want to have a battery-operated fan. Ryobi makes one, I know, because I have a couple of those. Um, these are big, powerful fans that use the 18-volt batteries. And those run for a long time. So if you need to get a, you know, spray them with water and hit them with a big fan like that, it can be life-saving. But without a generator, if you're out in a place that's hot, they're not going to survive that, okay? So you're going to have to make sure you have a generator. Now, too, if there's a place that there's shade, you know, a shaded room, a room that's kept dark, it tends to be a little cooler. But uh, without air conditioning in that situation, you're going to be in trouble. So now, there's little things you might not think of. We have in our van, and I'm going to show everybody who's a patron exactly how that van is set up. But in our van, we have a HEPA filter. We have the adapter, so it goes right into the 12 volt DC, turns it into 120 volts, and runs that HEPA filter. Because we're in fire country, folks. And if you're in fire country, even if you're not in fire country, even if you're in a place where it doesn't happen very often, you should prepare for it. And one of the reasons for that is if it doesn't happen very often, your fire department probably isn't like ours. And they're right on it here. You see the helicopters coming over to drop water, you see the the tanker's coming in and dropping, you know, and uh, so, but if you're in a place that doesn't have fires very often, the fire department's probably not as on it as they are in California. So you have to think of a, uh, first thing to do is to think of a list that's the absolute bare minimum of what you're going to need to take care of your birds, all right? Uh, so you know you're going to have to have an, emer an emergency bag. You're going to store it close to the cage, not where they can get in and chew on it, you know, but somewhere near the cage where you can grab the bird into the carrier, grab the stuff they need, you know, and head out. You're going to be planning ahead to save their little lives, okay? And each type of disaster that there is, 
you know, you have to face them differently. They are not the same issue. Like with earthquakes here, when we first came in and, and came to this uh, location, you know, we just come from the fire. So we get here on Sunday, I'm sitting back in the chair, and all of a sudden I start to feel this rolling motion. I can feel a roll and a roll, and it gets harder and harder and harder. I'm going, so what am I thinking about when the earthquake's coming? I'm thinking about, we've got a propane tank out there. There's a line coming in. I'm going to have to head out there and turn that propane off. Okay, I knew that. It's not like we've been here long enough for me to have a really good plan about how to get out. I had a general idea, but... So, instead of sitting there, what am I going to do? The first thing I'm thinking about is, let's get that, let's get that propane tank undone. Because propane just floods across the ground. And then if it hits a spark, man, it just flows. Oh, you don't want to be anywhere near that. I've seen plumbers without, without eyelashes. Okay, all the facial hair removed. Because propane was lying there under the, uh, a heater. Either a water heater or a wall heater. And they went to ignite that thing and... No fun. So you've got to have an evacuation plan and think about what kind of disasters happen in your area. You know, that you do, would you have fires like we do? Do you have flooding? Do you have hurricanes or tornadoes? Do you... <clears throat> and then... You're going to have to think about escape routes, okay? Not just one escape route, but an alternate. And as many alternates as possible. If you have more, if you have five ways you can get out of a place, plan a route on all five ways, because you never know what's going to happen, okay? Um, and think about traffic. Any of your routes that you're going to go, what kind of traffic is going to be there? Can you quickly load them up, you know? And get out of there before that traffic builds, possible. But you got to be able to get them out there. So you're going to have to plan the quick grab and run. Now, we get this every day because we have an aviary. So I go get a bird out of the aviary, get a bird out of the aviary. They're used to being grabbed that way. It's not much of a move there to go grab a bird, <laughs> out in the van. Grab a bird, out in the van. And the cages are all lined up. They're held in by rebar. So it's just boom, 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 load them up. Now, you, then, then you, I've already got water in the van. All I have to do is throw up a bag of food out there and, and bring their emergency kits. And you have to know on when one of these things strikes, you know, I understand you guys when it comes to hurricanes. You have a little time to plan usually. Tornadoes, not so much. Uh, but you don't want to have to think about it that day. You want to be able to just do it, okay? So it not only includes planning how you're going to get them out to the vehicle, making sure that that vehicle's got everything, has a way to strap them in and they're going to be safe, okay? Um, not just that, but you have to make it so that they're not going to freak out. That means you got to take them on little trips here and there in the bird carrier, if that's what you're using. So it's not going to be a, a, a hardship on their you know, personalities when you take them out the door. Now, if you've got more than one bird and you're loading them out into a vehicle, remember not to put them so close together that one can shoot the other's foot off. You know, they're going to be stressed. So even if they like each other, that can be a problem. Don't plan to put them all in one cage. I don't plan to put two birds in one cage. Um, you shouldn't do that on a general principle. If you're already doing it, which I would highly suggest that you separate birds and don't have them in the same cage. But um, if you already have that situation in a stressful situation, they may react differently than they normally do. So now sometimes those little dog carriers are better than other other uh, made for bird carriers because bird carriers are quite often wire where they can reach through them. In dog carriers, it's harder for them to reach through. Don't forget, they got go-go gadget legs, boy. They can reach a long way. So I know because I've been working around and the next thing I know, I feel Cecil grabbing my hind end because that's the way he is. Right? You guys are awfully quiet. Liven this thing up a bit. What are you doing, Lorelai? You need to do something. 
them. <laughs> They're not very lively. Bob's tearing up a bunch of wood, though. Aren't you, Bob? So you're going to want to make sure that they have their food and water while you're on the road. Now, most of these guys aren't going to eat while they're being driven around in an emergency. Um, birds generally, just like us, you know, that, that, that sympathetic nervous reaction that you, what are you doing? No, no, no. Snowball. Snowball. No. Snowball. No. Laurel, I get out of there. Um, no mating. This is not a bordello. It's not a bordello. Well, I hope it's not a bordello. So, may, may, but have the food accessible and the water accessible because they're going to need it eventually. Okay? And if you only have a regular old radio so you can get weather conditions and traffic updates, fine. Better to have a cell phone. You might still have internet access. You can get what you need. Best is to go ahead and get a scanner, at least get a scanner, so that you can see what's going on on the emergency channels. The ham radio enthusiasts will usually be following what's going on, and also those ham repeaters, those big towers they have to repeat all the ham signals that are in the area. Believe it or not, this kind of stuff goes on, all right? Uh, they often are carrying the traffic of the fire and other emergency services. So you can listen in and see what's happening. Absolute best is to go ahead and get yourself a ham radio license. It's not that hard. Um, get yourself a little ham radio so that you can call out and get help if you need it. When the cell towers go down and the phones go down, you'll still have your ham radio, okay? And in an emergency, you can reach people who can help. Hey, hey, hey. Easy, easy. Easy. You can leave her alone now. You come over and sit on my chest. You leave her alone. Bob, what are you doing? No, you don't need to get, no, you don't need to worry about her. Bob, no, you're not going to worry about Chloe. It's all right. It's okay. Come on. Come on. It's, it's all right. You don't need to worry about Chloe. Oh, you got to poop. Oh, that's going to be a little queen of mess. But that's not unusual for you. Hey, now come on. Cecil's going to come over here and get your attention. No. Leave her alone. No. That wasn't nice. Was it, Cecil? You feel comfortable up there? Okay. <sighs> so you folks on the, on the coast that have hurricanes and, and storms... You usually have a little time to prepare. You've got the National Oceanic Administration telling you if there's something approaching and you know there's a situation. They tell you to hunker down and that kind of thing. Um, my dad used to joke about that. They, he said that you, they tell you to, to get underneath a desk and put your hands behind your head and you know bend over and he'd say, kiss your hind end goodbye. Um, but, but at least you guys have some kind of plans. Um, now, when you're getting ready to go, we're going to go into this in more detail, but just in general, when you're getting ready to, grow, to go, if you're going to leave, if you're dealing with a hurricane or a, torna a tornado, remove anything that could be out in the yard that could end up slamming into your home and destroying it, board up your windows, that kind of thing, shut off the electricity and the gas and the water, okay? Don't need flooding. Don't need gas, certainly don't need gas. And lock the doors. That's like that's gonna keep the criminals out. As my dad used to say, I'm gonna quote my dad again, the only reason you have a lock on your door is to keep the honest people out. Now once you got your plan established, don't make any last minute changes unless there's an absolute reason you have to. Okay? In other words, the situation as such is not safe to go the other way. Otherwise, don't make any changes, okay? Don't suddenly decide, well, you know, there's a ch shelter over there. There's a shelter over here that says that they'll take birds now. <laughs> now you're changing your plan. You were planning to go to Aunt Edna's. You know, Aunt Edna may not be the friendliest person in the world. You've already talked to her, though, and she's okay with you bringing your birds. 
don't make any changes. Stick to your plan, okay? Unless it's absolutely a necessity that you don't. In other words, it's going to be more life-threatening. Now make make your arrangements with you know, with friends or relatives or whatever ahead of any problems. Don't wait until, oh no, there's a hurricane coming. Let me see if I can do this. Make your plans ahead of time, okay? And make alternate plans because you may have planned to stay with Aunt Edna, but she's now on a, she's taking a cruise, right? She's decided she wants to cruise through the Red Sea. Who knows why, but she's nowhere around. So have a few multiple plans. Right? Right, Lorelei? You can play a little bit with Cecil. Just don't get too... Don't, he usually is gentlemanly, but you can never tell. She did have... Uh, does Laurelin implant, so... She isn't quite as minxy as she was before. Now another thing is, you may be in a disaster, and you're not home. Well... What's the idea there? Be sure you have a neighbor or two that you can count on if you're ever away from home and a problem happens. So make sure that your neighbor knows how to check on your birds, how to feed them, make sure they have water, okay? They know where everything is and that they have your permission in writing if they have to evacuate your birds with them, okay? It's got to be in written, written permission now. And also, uh, set up with your vet that your vet will treat them if your birds are brought in by someone else and that you're going to pay for it. Stop that. You stop it. You're just doing that to irritate me because you want to get Chloe. I know your game. I know your game, cutie pie. You just can't stand to have Chloe on his couch, can you? No, you can't. Now, the bird carrier. Each bird needs its own separate carrier. Okay, it should obviously it needs a perch and food bowls and water bowls. Um, make sure your bird's okay with the cage. The last thing you don't you, you definitely don't want to be in a situation where you're trying to shove your bird into one of these things and they're going with wings out. I'm not going in there. Okay, um, Barbara Heidenreich has a good video on how to do that on how to train your birds to get into a carrier. So I recommend that. Um, we also have our training videos, and if you think it out, you can make it work. You know, you can train them to get into a small carrier. Um, you're going to want to label the cage with your bird's name, okay? You're going to want a tag on it that has your name and address and phone number. Um, you may need to reinforce it if you've got someone like Cecil that takes cages apart for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Okay, so you may have to get some heavy gauge wire and reinforce areas. He just ripped. He just ripped the plastic apart. If you put it in a dog carrier, he just shred it. Um, Lucy wouldn't do that. Chloe wouldn't do that. Snowball might. Bob. Bob would. Yeah, Bob would. You stop biting. Now you cut it out. You're getting on this way. That's Chloe. She can sit on that side. She can sit there. Oh, beautiful song, Peaches. Beautiful song. Now, you do want to bring toys with you, okay? But you don't want to leave them in the carriers while you're driving. If you're going to be moving, no toys. They can be, they can get caught in them. They can get hurt, okay? You may also want to bring some covers along. I highly suggest that. If you cover them up, they, most birds will be calmer, covered. Some aren't. You may have to uncover some birds because it freaks them out to be moving around in the dark. Um, or like Coco, she gets motion sick. So, um, emotion sickness is a serious thing for them to be throwing up their food. It's okay to regurgitate, but throwing up their food is not a good thing. And if they're doing it um, the whole time you're traveling and you got to travel for two or three hours, you need to know if your bird's got motion sickness and you need to get 
medicine for that right away from your vet in case something happens. Okay, stop that. You're just doing that so you can get to Chloe. I know it. He's nipping at my, my shirt to get my attention. Now, in the emergency kit, what should you have in it? You should have a medical kit. We discussed that in one of our other videos. I'll put that in the show notes so you can watch that video. You should have an aviator harness. They should be trained to get in it because you may need to move these birds around. And if you're conscientious enough to allow them to have the ability to fly, then you should have a harness. You should also know how to hold their feet properly so you can carry them around without a harness. But keep in mind, you know, things happen. You might trip. You're holding a bird. Could be a problem. Uh, you don't want them to get away because if they get scared, they'll come back to you if they can. But if they get scared, they won't. They will think you're going to come after them. Like in flapping their arms. It's kind of funny. They do sort of seem to think that we can follow them when they fly. So obviously you need bowls, paper towels. Uh, if you can hook up those licks at once where you can put the little bracket in and you put the little twist, that's what we have out in the van, the little twist uh, cups, that's the best case scenario, okay, because they're easy to wash. You can take them in and out. Um, the food you bring with you should be enough for seven days. The bottled water, uh, if you keep it out in your vehicle and it gets hot, that's not a good thing, and you don't want it exposed to the sun. Uh, sunlight in those little plastic bottles can create bacteria inside. Stop it. You can bring some canned veggies and that kind of thing if your bird likes that stuff. Um, be sure you have a can opener though. Um, another thing you need to put in that bag is your parrot ID kit. That'll have the ID. They should be chipped, microchipped. If that bird gets away somehow, you guys get separated in an emergency. You want to be able to get your bird back, the microchip will definitely make that easier. In that same bag, you want to put a flashlight and extra batteries, okay? Or even better, a little hand crank lantern, the kind they sell for camping, emergencies. Another thing not to overlook, to make sure you bring any veterinary documents you have, uh, their health records and that kind of thing. Now about microchipping, maybe you put it off, you know, not wanting to stick something in your bird's chest that's going to be there forever, that's understandable. Um, but there's no other way, if you get separated from your bird, that you're going to be able to get them back. How are you going to prove that's your bird anyway? You know, you might be able to talk to them, they may come to you, that's possible. But uh, if they go to the vet and they've got that chip in there, they're going to come back to you, okay? If they've got a leg band, you can record that number, but here's the, here's the problem with that. Hey, you guys, don't get too into it. That can be easily cut off, okay? Another good thing to have is take pictures of your bird. Also, write out a good description of your bird, the things it says, the way it acts, it's the way it looks. If they have, like, a salamander, a missing toe, be sure you know where that missing toe is, what foot, and which of the four, one, two, three, four toes it is. You know, for, right, if you're on the right, right foot, you would have the outermost front toe, innermost front toe, that kind of thing. Uh, you also should have your own physician, emergency contact numbers, and numbers for everybody in your family. You want to have all that readily available, ready to go, okay? That's easy for me on my family, because I don't have any family contacts. I have friends and all this, those, but, you know, my family is, uh, I think they're on the planet Xeno, but I haven't been to planet Xeno, so I'm not sure. You also need to pack all your bird's medicines in there. Now you're not going to be able to do that till the day you leave, so make sure the medicines are still in their original boxes, or their original containers with the prescriptions on them, okay? And it's not a bad idea to put a little note in there, what they need and when they need it, and how to give it. Because it, I give medicine to almost all these birds, not all, Bob doesn't get any, uh, for example. But the way 
for example, let's see, with Snowball, he can sit down and mixed into a little bit of peanut butter. He can take it with a syringe. You can syringe it into his beak. Um, he doesn't like that, but he'll he'll do it. You know, if you talk nice to him, he'll do it. Having a battery-powered radio or a scanner is a great idea, police scanner. But a ham operator's license and an amateur radio, you can get them for 50 bucks. They have these bow fangs for $50, these Chinese things. They're not the greatest radios. They do bleed across frequencies. I've seen it. We've tested it at our ham uh, radio club here in here near the sanctuary, and uh, they bleed, okay? They bleed bad. But in an emergency, it doesn't matter. You, you can still get help. They run about five watts. Uh, you can get, you want to spend a little more money, you can get 10 watts. You want to put a mobile unit in your vehicle, you can get 50 watts. Um, we have a 50 watt in the vehicle, and we have a handheld transceiver. That's a five watt, Yezu. Yezu's a good product. Yeah, it's gonna be a little more money, but you'd be, you'd be happier with a Yezu, trust me. Um, you can't use these without a license though. The FCC regulates this. It would be like going on and broadcasting television. Believe me, they can find you too. You think you can do this without, you know, I can do this without having the license. No, they can triangulate you and they can find you. So it's not that hard to get a license. Um, now, if you find yourself in a situation with a fire and there's smoke, one way to keep them from getting smoke inhalation or at least reducing it while you give them out to the vehicle is to have a pillowcase. If you've got a fairly thick pillowcase that's, you know, the, the thread number is really high and have a high thread number, I can't tell you what that is because I can't remember, but you want to go with a high thread number, put them in the pillowcase and take them out. Um, a few band-aids, I mean, you might need a few band-aids because they aren't going to be happy with that, but that can be the, the difference between life and death, okay? Have that HEPA filter in your vehicle and you, know, you might manage to get them through a, a smoky situation. It's not easy, they react to it fast and they get that smoke in their lungs and they can kill them right away or like what happened to a friend of mine, it took a week or two, but it did happen. So you just take them out of the cage, put them in a pillowcase, tie it off, take them outside. Now, if you're not there and there's a situation and you know, you've got you've already talked to your neighbor, you need a you need one of those stickers on your door, it's a pet sticker, is there's there's a bird inside. That way if there's a fire or something, the firefighters can see it. I'll see there's there's a bird inside. <clears throat> And also, you want to make sure you have your vet, besides having your vet number written down, have it in your cell phone, okay? Your mobile phone should have your vet number in it and an alternate, okay? Uh, if there's an emergency vet clinic, have the address and phone number of it. Being prepared for unexpected emergencies can save their lives, but it can also save yours. And as you're preparing to make sure they're okay, you'll be also helping the rest of your family, because everybody in your family should start thinking about what do we do if there's an emergency. And if you plan ahead, um, that planning you do ahead can save you minutes, and those minutes can be the difference between life and death, okay? When I smelled that smoke, when we had the fire, I smelled that smoke, and then I looked up and I saw a wisp of smoke in the kitchen and I couldn't see where it was coming from. I grabbed a bird and a carrier. And it, that was before, <laughs> that was before I even knew. You know, I had just started the sanctuary. So I, it, it just started a couple of years before. And I didn't have the preparation I should have had, but I grabbed them and I got, I only had three carriers. I had six birds in the sanctuary at that time. And it was just one, two in one cage, one, two in another, and got them out the door. Um, so... And as I'm going out, the walls catch on fire. The most critical thing to saving your life and the life of your birds is planning ahead for different situations. So plan ahead. Remember to take care. To plan all contingencies. And it can make the difference between life and death. 
We welcome your feedback on our videos. We look forward to your insights, tips, questions, stories, and pictures. You can email us at cockatude at chloesanctuary.org, reach us on Twitter at sign Chloe Sanctuary, and join with us on our Facebook Chloe Sanctuary page. The science knowledge only adds to the excitement, the mystery, and the awe of a flower.